Hello, and welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and in this episode, we're going to talk about designing an American social credit score. Right now, around the world, nations are going through significant social and cultural upheavals. In an attempt to proactively combat dissent and establish more control over citizenry, China recently rolled out its social credit score. Importing the existing design into American society would likely fail, but that doesn't negate the beneficial idea behind parts of the program. Viewing China's system as a technological prototype to be built upon opens us up to new opportunities. We know that being the first to develop technology isn't always a guarantee of success. Before Facebook, right, there was MySpace, there were MP3 players, and there was the iPod. China's social credit score is Orwellian, but an American system doesn't have to be. If we're open to incentivizing good behavior in the United States and believe in the personal, professional, and, and really communal benefits to civic engagement, then an American social credit score might be what we need. Exploring frameworks for how we might structure a new version begins with understanding why we would benefit and, and what it might look like. Thanks again for tuning in to the Thinking Progressive podcast. So we begin with the concept of how do we separate reputation from capital? Reputation has played a role in trust and access within human society since its inception. History is bursting with heroes of great deeds that we remember and, and really probably so many more that we don't. Now, reputation used to spread much slower in the past than it does today, essentially re raising the requirement of, of renown. Today, celebrity occurs rapidly and frequently, moving in different directions and degrees. More people are getting more recognition for their hard work, and that's a great thing for society, right? It's happening in a lot of different directions, but there's also a price to this progress. Profit pathways incentivize behaviors that are actively detrimental to the person and society. So some Instagram celebrities, for example, will make more of a single post than most Americans do in their lifetime of labor. All of this to support manipulations to consume through algorithmic advertising, right? We're being targeted by this uh, to shape our behavior. Studies have shown that frequent social media use can erode self-control. Uh, it's led to increased spending and bouts of binge eating. And social platform use correlates to increased anxiety, lower moods, and depression. Could it be because of the endless comparing to one another, the constant advertising, or the consistent political agitation we face on these platforms? The want for something better is not a denial of good deeds past, right? There, there are aspects of social media that have been extremely positive for individuals and society as a whole. The question facing us is, how do we amplify the positive elements while diminishing the detrimental drawbacks? Today, social media platforms are a dominant form of public-facing reputation management. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, and Instagram hold the dominant share of influencers operating under models seeking essentially to extract wealth from users. Uh, and those users can come in the form of uh, individuals, consumers, or through advertisers. Now here, evidence emerges for the first failure of the present day social platforms. There is an inherent contradiction between seeking to maximize profits and encouraging community mindful behavior. Profit seeking requires the constant financialization of services and in the context of social media, leads to people being confined to echo chambers of opinions that they already share. Facebook is the number one social media platform globally in terms of uh, total users. And the outreach model that Facebook implements is one where the most direct path to growing a following is to pay to advertise your page. And once you've acquired an adequate following, organic or paid, it doesn't matter, the only way to reach your entire audience is to pay again to promote your posts. If you have a Facebook page, your organic posts only reach about 6.4% of your total followers. This walled garden approach to reputation expansion reinforces the elevation of moneyed participants over local contributors. Average people have little voice on social media compared to corporations. There is an entirely new generation of political candidates who are running for office refusing corporate money, and they share the struggle of unequal reach due to well-financed political machines. 
So we have political campaigns financed by corporations who are sending their money to other corporations to dominate and influence the minds of the user base. And in the case of you know, the newly progressive candidate and the newly progressive movement, uh, so the majority of candidates I imagine are not taking uh, corporate or special interest money, um, how are they to compete on a fair political landscape? Because you know, I, I think that's the objective of a democracy, right? We want at least to have a contest of ideas. But really the ultimate failure of the current social media platforms is that they have given immense unelected power to Mark Zuckerberg. He is actively participating in a political election and is forming alliances that will likely be very beneficial if Trump wins re-election. Mark is a tragic case. He is the millennial who could have led transformation and he has succumbed to the existing order. We cannot count on Mark Zuckerberg to do the right thing for society. He has consistently demonstrated that he only works to further his agenda. Social networks on consumer generation platforms will never serve the public good. They will always further condition us to the consumerist mindset. Any social platform that allows advertising becomes a tool of the wealthy to spread their messages to the masses. We need more in-depth communication with each other, not new forms of economic oppression. So, you know, when we hear the words social credit score, we immediately imagine this dystopian nightmare. And on paper, China's social credit system reads as an ambitious plan, right? What they published is to push the nation forward. The theory is that improving social cohesion and economic strength requires that citizens embrace their ranking method. It rewards people for doing things such as praising the government, donating to charities, donating blood, uh, and contributing to their communities. Increasing your score provides access to cheaper transportation, priority to for school admissions for the individual and their children, uh, tax breaks, and other opportunities to encourage active participation. Scores reduce for people playing too many video games, spreading fake news, quote unquote, um, refusing military service, or providing, uh, quote unquote, dishonest apologies for crimes committed. The consequences for low scores are the removal of access from public transportation, and that could be air or rail, um, denying access to the best jobs and the best schools, throttling internet speeds, and, uh, and many more. If you are interested in a full list, I'm going to provide all the links uh, in the description of the episode, so feel free to check that out. Now, the worst consequence of China's social credit score is blacklisting. Chinese journalist Liu Hu was fined and blacklisted for writing about censorship and government corruption. He received no notification, no appeal process, and is now unable to buy plane tickets, travel some train lines, purchase property, or even take out a loan. Now, China argues that the policy is for the health of the nation. Um, Samantha Hoffman of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute disagrees. Uh, she said that there are, quote, no genuine protections for the people and entities subject to the system. And that's because China's vague laws like, quote unquote, endangering national security can be imposed at will for any cause. The social credit score ultimately seems to serve a single purpose, strengthening the Chinese Communist Party by weakening its dissenters. Ultimately, I predict that China's credit score is going to lay the foundation for the demise of the regime. It is a clear path to create separate levels of citizenship within society. How many generations will pass before the second class citizens revolt against the system that limits their potential from birth based on their parents' actions? History shows us that humanity will not suffer oppression indefinitely. Now, designing an American social credit score uses China's framework as a starting point. We recognize that the positive aspects of rewarding good social behavior might be worth keeping, but we reject many of the program traits from the start, especially their system of punishment. China provides the United States a launch pad to move forward from, but we need to develop a direction before we can progress. So exploring a framework for how we might structure this system begins really with our objectives. We want to direct an American social credit score to incentivize participation in civil society and democracy. The aim is to make being a better citizen a rewarding habit, not to punish people. A social credit score in the United States should focus on incentivizing action through positive reinforcement while avoiding the authoritarian and opaque disciplinary measures included in China's. 
Coupling good behavior with tangible value creates an opt-in social training system. We incentivize better humanity, and over time, the routine becomes frequent, easy, and enjoyed. Citizens will achieve mastery. Mastering anything is a direct result of continued focus and effort. It is the continued reinforcement of habits in a long but focused direction. Most people can master most things. There's not really a secret to it. Uh, learning to be a good citizen is no different than learning anything else. The objective of an American social credit score is to provide an accessible pathway for more people to become more involved with social life. There are several approaches to determining what we may incentivize. The path of least resistance is reviewing China's rewards and seeing what we want to import to the United States. Look, donating blood, helping out your local community, and engaging in charity work are all easy additions to our new social credit score, um, as you know, we probably all recognize those as very positive contributions. Having good credit score and taking care of the elderly family members can likely be excluded for the new system. Credit scores already act as a pseudo social score here in the United States and are disproportionately advantageous to those with existing wealth. Um, so our social credit score intends to allow people to express their humanity outside of the constraints of capital. Now, Americans typically have strong aversions to having the government regulate family matters and elderly care would be better served by a collective investment through Medicare for all and expanding social security. A counter argument might be that our aging population is growing um, and they're living longer while a lot of millennials struggle financially. So it may be a worthy incentive option for us to choose. We can democratically select the behaviors we want to promote through a public vote. I mean, that would be the ideal pathway. This philosophy allows us to codify challenge and change into the structure of the credit score. The project is not a government imposition. It's a democratically developed and publicly owned process. Citizens should always have the option to realign the reward and form of incentive. So we want to give them the ability to change this system um, as it needs changing. Uh, for so long, our institutions have been rigid and slow to evolve, and that's part of the problem. Now, Voting is a great example of a habit we can promote. The deepening of democracy is a project central to the transformation of society. We need more people engaging with the possible directions of our shared future. American democratic participation is, is comparatively weak to other nations and voting incentives could get people to the polls. Tying voting to the social credit score also lays the foundation for expanding democracy through more public votes in the future. Focusing more on expanding democracy, we could imagine the production of nonpartisan content relating to important issues in elections. Democracies would benefit from a publicly owned information source where every policy had a plethora of factually verified informational videos, formal debates of the opposing viewpoints, and other resources that would earn readers and watchers credit. This kind of microtransaction approach to becoming better citizens allows for the process to be easy, convenient, and habit-forming. Fighting the climate crisis can be integrated into a reward system to turn personal efforts into a mass movement. We can incentivize more public transit use where available. Uh, public transit is better for the environment, reduces commutes, and can generate surpluses for municipalities. Continuing on the focus of fighting the climate crisis, we may want to incentivize dietary changes. Meat is the second largest source of pollution in the world uh, and is the, the primary contributor to the burning rainforest. Transitioning our diets to be wholly plant-based would be better for the planet, better for our wildlife, and, and better for our health. Now, I will say this framework requires accurate measurement methods, and I haven't written the blueprint for those at the moment, but you know, Americans are innovative. Now, the system doesn't need to tie actions to specific rewards either. Our, our objective from the start is to avoid confining Americans to menial labor. Instead, we can imagine a more broad approach based on a point system that encouraged behavior in, in really a variety of directions. We can cap total rewards or put time limitations on spending the points, and that may be necessary to avoid abuse of the platform, but ultimately you know, that can be decided democratically. When the Chinese system operates as a method to reinforce rigid conformity to the Communist Party's demands, 
An American social credit score should function as a tool for the expansion of our humanity. It should be used as a pathway to shared bigness, supporting a culture of support and empathy. Continuing education and training would be an ideal activity to reward. As many states begin the shift to free public college tuition, we encourage people to expand their skill sets in their free time. Now, learning doesn't need to be tied to purely academic pursuits either. Community classes in woodworking, meditation, there's a plenty of other pursuits that could fall under this category. We focus on getting people out of their homes and into community spaces to interact and learn with each other. Mentoring programs could be another form of social credit accumulation. Both the mentor and the mentee could earn points through structured programs. Mentorship programs impacting disenfranchised communities would receive priority during the early stages and serve as a testing ground for the program expansion. There's a nearly endless supply of positive social projects we could develop over time. And you know, we are ensuring that we're crafting policies for all stakeholders, especially traditionally marginalized groups. We want to give people the ability to create incentives customized to their communities. Over time, what begins as a top-down opt-in system evolves into a self-perpetuating model that allows us to direct our social potential democratically. Now, American social credit rewards may take many forms and, and vary between communities to better meet their needs. Continuing to follow our process, we use China as the first step in a series. Many of China's incentives are financial. Um, high scores receive discounts on energy bills, better loan interest rates, uh, renting appliances without deposits. Nine financial incentives include skipping uh, lines at the airport and the train station, as well as more eclectic rewards like getting better matches on dating websites. An American social credit score should ideally avoid tying incentives to finance, yet we can't deny that this project is a long-term plan to shift our ethos, and we have to implement our motivations in a way that will work. Uh, people want to have the rewards, right? That's critical. A mix of low tag varied capital incentives and tangible non-capital incentives would be an excellent starting mix, a great place to begin. The best method to determine the first round of rewards would be a, a public vote, but we can imagine some ideas. China's incentive for reducing energy bills is a good starter policy. It's something that we could structure in a way where the max benefit people could receive would be equal, so it's equal for everyone but it is disproportionately beneficial to the American poor, right? Like, so if, if uh, someone making $35,000 a year doesn't have to pay a hundred dollar electric bill, that's huge compared to someone making a million dollars a year, right? That, that really matters. Um, so it's an equal incentive, but it really has a deeper impact. Um, skipping transportation queues is another good idea. I like that. Um, and it could be expanded to include first class seating. I love that by removing the privileges association, uh, the privilege of first class seating with wealth and tying it to social action, we make a small movement forward in realigning our cultural priorities. We could remove the private interest from the Federal Reserve's activity, but it, it presents us really an excellent opportunity to design this incentive for our most disenfranchised, including marginalized communities and stakeholders. We develop incentives based really on the needs of the people. Now, impacting your dating websites uh, results, that, that seems pretty awful to me. I mean, the argument for it, I guess, would be the general support for public knowledge of social credit scores. That feels a little too much like life imitating art. If you've ever seen uh, the Black Mirror episode uh, called Nosedive, uh, if you haven't, you should. Uh, because again, we should consider, I'm making an argument for uh, an American social credit score, but you know, I'm open to criticizing myself. We should consider that if America does adopt a social credit score, the possibility does exist that it bleeds into our personal lives as well. So that is a you know potential pitfall, maybe. I don't know if it would be a pitfall, um, but it's an it's an alternative direction that is possible to occur. So to wrap up the financial rewards, I'll just give a few more small ones. We could waive vehicle registration fees, uh, give more desirable parking spots. I mean, that's an intangible one and free public transportation. Again, equal rewards that disproportionately benefit the most disenfranchised. American social credit scores could also function as an experimental tool to expand social consciousness and, and protections. Imagine a scenario where we conduct a public vote on the question, is food a human right in the United States in 2019? If yes wins, the social credit score could be a catalyst for the implementation. An incentive in support of the resolution could be free food from food banks. 
So coupled with additional public investment, we could ensure that every community has access to healthy and fresh food. The incentive requirement for the food could be waived entirely for communities in need and something really simple for others. Recycling correctly is a great example. These are just a few examples of incentivized social credit score that may be used to raise the floor for millions of Americans. By structuring our incentives in a way that provides the most significant impact for low and middle class America, we lay the foundation for a transformation of our national psyche. Thinking long term, rewards with the most frequent claims develop pathways to deeper social protections. The structure of our program continually evolves as new needs arise and old ones fade. Now, architecting a new social credit score requires a lot of effort unrelated to the fun part of deciding how we want to incentivize people. We have to answer how we would implement the program in an easily accessible fashion, how we would prevent abuse, and how we would fund the incentives. The platform that records score accumulation and provides access to incentives needs to be readily accessible through several mediums. The most obvious of which is secure online platform with a well-designed user experience, People would need unique identifiers to avoid abuse of the system, and these could take the form of a social security number, a blockchain identification, or alternative methods focusing on personal security that either exist or have yet to be invented. Access to the platform would need to be made available in the form of a website, an app, and through direct human interaction wherever needed. People would be automatically registered for the process, training at an age where people could determine um, or they could opt out. You know, they'd have the option to opt out. It, again, we want to keep it as participatory as possible, but incentivize it where there's no, there's no incentive not to be a part of it. Now, abuse preventing begins with the design of the program. Throughout this exploration, we've been suggesting incentives that are open to everyone, but provide a higher degree of relative advantage to people in low and middle income classes. Capping total points earned within a year may also serve to disincentivize people from trying to churn through tasks. Coupled with a no rollover policy, we construct a system of small and moderate rewards that anyone can earn and spend within a year. Now, while the American social credit score breaks from the Chinese government version in not being a system of punishment, laws punishing system abuse should move forward with the introduction of the policy. We shouldn't wait for crisis. We can proactively deal with this. Every institutional project will have problems that designers and architects cannot see. People who are deliberately abusing the system for their gains, such as falsifying efforts or exploiting technological glitches, should lose access to the platform for periods of time and be personally responsible for paying back any ill-gotten financial incentives. But exploitation provides us additional opportunities to encourage good behavior. Instead of focusing solely on the punishment of bad actors, we can reward exploiters who discover and demonstrate problems without abusing them. Any person who proactively reports system flaws should earn credit. It's an approach that embraces our strive for continual improvement and rewards those with the abilities to enhance that effort. Like every other aspect of the American social credit score, how we pay for it is ultimately up to the people. Success depends on convincing the public that investing in ourselves and our communities is a worthwhile effort. Funding for the incentives could take the form of new taxation, redistributing existing spending, or plenty of other alternatives. Now, while it's true that the incentives we explore will reduce tax revenues from our lowest earners, uh, we'll be taking less from them, and increasing spending on social programs, there are significant intangible benefits to social investment. By incentivizing small-scale benefits in a wide variety of directions, we relieve burdens from many American families. The result is enhancing the freedom to experiment, grow, and self-actualize. Building better human beings requires work, but the rewards are exponential when we view it through the lens of the collective society. Now, as the program would benefit the majority of working class Americans, we can imagine that there will be conservative political pushback against government overreach. Progressives seeking to expand a social credit score would be well served by informational campaigns targeting rural and urban areas to ensure that those who most benefit from the system understand what it is and why it will help. An American social credit score is a proactive approach towards decreasing social division we recognize the problem for what it is, and we engage it head on. 
incentivizing democratic citizenship in methods designed by the people for the people. If social media has taught us anything, it is that we are trainable beings. Their behavior modification techniques alter us without consent. An American social credit score provides a chance to choose what we want to reinforce and reward. The process creates opportunities for learning, for participating, and network building. Our only limitation is our imagination.